Right, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing good. We are getting ready to uh, embark on a new chapter. And uh, I was looking at our schedule and I mentioned last class that we have our spring break coming up. This is messed up. It should be uh, starting on March 8th is spring break. And so uh, we have today and then we have, uh, what's today, Wednesday? We have two days next week and then we have spring break, right? So I would anticipate that I will be giving you your midterm take-home exam uh, probably next Wednesday. And then I'll make that due probably the week after we come back from spring break, like the week after. So you'll have a week after spring break to work on it. So what would that be? That would be, uh, hold on, March. Wait, what day are we on? So that would be, it'd probably be due like on the 22nd, I'm thinking. So you'll have plenty of time with the exam. All right, uh, down to business now. So were there any questions before I start? Anything that you had need clarification on or anything from the last chapter? Uh, you said the 22nd of March? Uh, yeah, is when it would be due. Um, oh, the midterm, but it would be assigned like a week before? Or you said uh, next week? Next week, yeah. So you're going to have like three weeks, almost three weeks with it. So, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you have plenty, plenty of time. Um, all right, so yeah, so um, this this chapter we're going to be doing um, the name of the chapter is I think partial derivatives, but if we start out with eleven point one, which is called functions of several variables. So before I actually start that, I want to just talk generally about things that we already have experienced in our mathematical lives in terms of functions. So functions, you know, when we first started studying them, you know, we start with like lines and then, you know, maybe we get to like parabolas or something like that. And then we get into pre-cal and we start looking at trig functions and, you know, we've got exponential functions, whatever, all these different functions we've studied. All of these have the same basic principle in mind. And that is, you start out with a number x, you send it through a function, and it comes out as a new a number, right? So it starts out as some number, whatever it is, goes through the function, comes out as a number. So, you know, one way, one way we could visualize this is like, um, let's just take a specific example. Let's just take x squared. What it does is it takes in a number and squares it, right? So what we do is we can, we can imagine taking a number line, taking any number on that number line, let's say the number three, and then we send that through. So it's like we pick that number up off the number line and we send it through the function that comes out as a nine. So this is our input. Our output is another number line, but now it gets dropped off at the number nine. So if we wanted to kind of like see what's happening, that three gets sent to that nine, right? And then we, we keep doing that for all, all the numbers in here. We just keep doing that, right? And they all get dropped off somewhere over here. Well, that's not a very good way to like visualize the function. So what we do is we, we take this number line, okay? Which is, you know, a straight line going in both directions forever. We call that R because it's all the real numbers on that number line, right? And the output, is another number line. So we have a number line that represents our input, a number line that represents our output. And so what we've come up with is a nice, clever way of visualizing this. We put the input number line here. We put the output number line vertically. And that's basically our XY coordinate system, right? And then what we can do is it's a lot easier to see what's happening because if we plug in three, it spits out nine. And we can look at that as an ordered pair like a point in, in two dimensional space, okay? So look at, look at the way I'm gonna write this. All of these functions, every single one of them, even in this example, they are all functions which take a real number and spit out a real number, right? 
Now that's mathematical notation. Mathematicians use this notation. But we've been limited to just that. I mean, we pretty much have only done in, in you know, Cal 1, Cal 2, pre-Cal, college algebra, it was always functions going from R into R. But there's nothing that says that we can't do something different. Like, why not, why not uh, have a function that takes in a real number and in, instead of spitting out a real number, how about it spits out a two-dimensional vector, right? Now we did do that, that's a vector function. Because if you look at our vector functions like R of T, then you had like either two components if it was two dimensional or three components. And so what was happening here is we were taking in a number T and T is being sent to a vector. And that vector lives in two dimensional space, right? This vector. So we could look at a function that does that, which we have, but we can also do other things. We can do you know, something that takes a number in and spit something out in three dimensional space. Or we can have it spit something out in four dimensional space or five dimensional space. Doesn't matter what space there is. Let, let me give you an example of a function that would take one input in and give you something in five dimensions. You ready? So what if I define a function like this? F of X equals, okay, here's what it equals. It's gonna spit out two X, X squared, one plus X, um, e to the x sine x. Okay, so what does this function do? It takes in a number and it spits out an ordered, what, that's not an ordered pair, it's not an ordered triple, not an ordered quadruple, it's like an ordered, what, what's five? Quintuple. Quintuple. Quintuple or something like that, right? So you, you basically have a number that goes in and then a, a quintuple, ordered quintuple that comes out, right? And that would be an example of a function that goes from R1 or R, you know, R is R1. So just R into R5, five dimensional space. Now, we don't even have to do that. We can do it the other way around. We can do, we could, what about something that goes from R5 into R? So this is backwards. This is, it's taking in five different inputs and kicking out a number. So let me give you an example of that. I'm gonna call this function f of, well, I need five inputs, right? Not just one, five. So I'm gonna call the first input x1. I'll call the second one x2, x3, x4, x5. And then what it's gonna do at the end, it's gonna kick out one number. So I'm just gonna make this up x1 squared plus 3x2 minus sine of x3 plus, um, how about 2 to the x4 and then plus x5. So now if you give me a number, right, or if you give me an input like 1, negative 2, 4, 3, 7, I will be able to produce a single number as an output, won't I? So like where in, the, where in the real world would you see something like that? Think about uh, weather forecasting, right? Something like they're trying to predict the, the chance of rain, right? So they have a formula, some function, and they take in, they take in uh, barometric pressure, they take in humid, relative humidity, they take in you know, all these different variables, right? Those are all your inputs. And then they run it through some formula and that formula is gonna give you like the, the chance, the probability of rain, okay? So what I'm trying to get you to see is that we no longer wanna limit ourselves to functions just, that just take numbers to numbers. We wanna be able to expand it out to now where you can take a number in and get an order triple out, or maybe you take an order triple in, you get a number out. Um, and there's also nothing stopping you from doing something like this. How about a function that goes from R3 into R2. So you take three numbers in and you spit two numbers out. Simple example of that. Um, let me see, I'm gonna take three numbers in. So I'm gonna call it X, Y, Z instead of X1, X2, X3. So I take three numbers in, X, Y, and Z, and my output needs to be two dimensional. So here, let's say that the first answer is X, how about X times Y times Z? And the second part is X plus Y plus Z. 
right? So now you, you give me three inputs and I'll give you an ordered, an ordered pair as an output, okay? So what chapter 11 is about is about functions of several variables. And so what, I'm, what we're referring to here is a function where you have several variables going in and then you have some output. And then the, the question becomes, what does the calculus look like when you're dealing with functions like this? So how does calculus play into it? Can you still talk about instantaneous rates of change? Just like we did with the derivative in Cal 1, right? Can you talk about areas under curves or something similar to it? Is there an, an analogy to it when we start talking about things like this? All right, is that clear? Does that make sense kind of where we're going with this a little bit? Yeah. Now there is, there is one thing I will add on this before we move on is this is where things can start to get really difficult because when you look at this right here, our traditional function, when we go to graph it, our graph looks like this, right? And that's two dimensional. So I'm gonna put R2 here. So in order to visualize a function that takes a number and spits out a number, I need two dimensions to visualize that, that graph, right? If I have a function that goes from like this one, from one dimension into three dimensions, if I ever wanted to visualize that, how many dimensions would I need to visualize it? What do you think? Four. You need four. You need one dimension. So you need like a line that would represent your input, right? Okay, but see, here's the problem. Now I need three dimensions, three number lines somehow placed in here so I can visualize each of the output pieces. And so I need four dimensional space to visualize it, which means we aren't visualizing it, okay? Because you can't visualize four dimensional space. I mean, you can, but it's tricky. But as soon as you get to like something like this, it's over, okay? because now you need six dimensions. You need one for the input and five for the output. So you're not visualizing this function. And so as, you, as we start to progress into functions of several variables, in this class, we're going to limit, limit ourselves to stuff that stays in three-dimensional space and four-dimensional space. We will not go past that. But mathematicians, like pure mathematicians, have to start dealing with things in higher dimensional space and so because you don't have the visual part of it, um, it becomes more difficult, right? And one last thing, sorry, I promise I'll make this the last thing. Do y'all remember in college algebra study, studying complex numbers? Do y'all remember studying uh, numbers like three plus four I? Yeah. Okay, now I don't know, it depends on the college algebra class you took, but there is a way to visualize that number. Like you can visualize that number. And what we do is we, we put it on a, on a flat sheet of paper and we say, okay, the three is what we call the real part. And then the four right here, the four I goes here. And then that right there, that dot represents that complex number. So I don't know how many of you saw this, but you can do this for a bunch of numbers like negative, uh, 2i would just be um, go down two, and it would be that dot. And then you can do this for, for all these numbers. And in fact, um, all the numbers that you already know, like eight, I don't know, let's not do eight, let's go negative one. Negative one is a complex number. It's a real number, but it's also a complex number. So that's just right here on the number line right here. Okay, so you see these three points, they're all complex numbers. And complex numbers are complex. They're difficult because they lack one of the most basic properties that we take for granted with numbers. And that is we don't have order, okay? There's no order when you talk about complex numbers. So if, if I give you, let's talk about real numbers. If I give you two numbers, let's say four and eight, then you can always say that one of them is bigger than the other or that they're the same, right? So give, give me any two real numbers, X and Y, and I'll always be able to put this symbol between them, either that one or this one. Well, let me do it this way. 
It's either that, that, or this. And that's actually, well, as long as X and Y are elements of the real number system, as long as you have two real numbers, then either X is less than Y, X is bigger than Y, or X is equal to Y. And that's called, the, that's called trichotomy. So in the real numbers, you have trichotomy. In the complex numbers, you don't have trichotomy because there's no way to order them to say that one is bigger than the other. Does that make sense? Like if I, if I were to say, take this point here, and how about that point there? Which one of those is bigger? I mean, they're not the same, right? They, they're not the same, but how could you even talk about bigger? Now we do get, we do start doing things like we measure the distance from the point to the origin. And we call that the, the, um, the norm of the number, the modulus of the number, but it still doesn't give us the trichotomy we have here. So already things start to fall apart when we start dealing with complex numbers. But the bigger issue with complex numbers, and this is, this is the reason why in college algebra you don't study them that much, is because what if I wanted to define a function, and I'm gonna use z instead of x, where the function is z squared, and this time z can actually be a complex number. So I can, I can plug in any number I want here. I can, I can plug in four, I can plug in three, I can plug in i, I can plug in, three plus four I, negative two I, I can plug any number I want into this. Well, here's the problem. You're never gonna be able to visualize it. Why? Think about the input. The input is what? Complex number, right? Which you need two dimensions to visualize. And the output is gonna be a complex number, which you need two dimensions to visualize. And so what we have here, this function is a function that goes from R2, two-dimensional space, into two-dimensional space. And so you're never going to be able to look at a graph of a complex valued function and see it's like see the picture of it. You're not going to be able to. And that's why um, mathematicians will study, they, there's a class that you take called complex variables. And you cannot take this class until you have finished the entire calculus sequence and entire, until you've fin finished linear algebra. And it's because you are now about to embark on a math where you can't see what you're working with anymore. And that's a much more difficult thing to do when you can't visualize things. And so you have to be at a much more uh, mature level in terms of mathematical, mathematical maturity to be able to handle the things that are happening there, okay? All right, I think I've gone off enough on the tangent that I wanted to talk about there. Let's talk about the uh, functions of several variables that we are interested in at this point in time. So um, we have already seen in this class that if we ever put together an equation, if we ever have an equation that has X, Y, and Z in it, that it creates a surface in three-dimensional space. For example, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. That's a sphere. And do you remember us going over that section? Um, I think it was 10.8, all the quadratic surfaces, paraboloids, ellipsoids, hyperboloids, all that, those weird shaped things that, yeah, all those different things you had to complete the square and figure out what they look like. Okay, so we know that if we have an equation and it has three variables in it, that we're gonna get a surface. Now, if it's possible for us to isolate one of the variables, and, and for, for now, let's just talk about the z. If we can get z by itself, so you know, take this equation, move things around, and get z by itself isolated, then what we can say is that z depends just on x and y, right? You give me x and y, and I will be able to produce the z. So z then becomes a function of the other two variables, x and y. And so this is the notation that we are going to be looking at. Now, we still have to follow the rule of functions, which means one input, one output, right? One thing goes in, one thing goes out. But the, the difference here is that the thing that's going in is not a single number. It's a single point or a single ordered pair. Okay, so we have an ordered pair going in and then we have a number coming out. So this function goes from R2 into R. 
right? Two things in, one thing out. Can we visualize this? How many dimensions will we need? Three. We need three, right? Two for the input, one for the output. So we should be okay here, right? We should be able to visualize this. All right, so with this notation, it's important to see that the domain of the function, okay, the domain of the function are all the ordered pairs X and Y, which can be plugged into the function. This means our domain is an R2 and the range is an R, all right? So I'm just basically saying input is in two dimensional space, outputs in one, so we'll need three dimensions to visualize it. Let's just get some of the mechanics out of the way first. Here's an example of a function of two variables. Okay, I just said a function of two variables, meaning I have a function that has two input variables. All right. So first part A, we want to know um, what is, what is, uh, well, let me just grab this whole thing. We'll go do it over here. So this is just mechanics. That's all we're doing right now. Do we know how to handle or how to, um, how to read, you know, these things and what, what to do with them. So for this one, F of two, one, all that means is that I'm going to replace all the X's in this function with two and all the Y's with one. That's it, right? All the X's become twos and the Y's become one. So I'm going to just plug into here. I'm going to have square root of, let's see, two plus one plus one over uh, X was two, so two minus three. And so we get, what is that, four on top, square root of four is two over negative one, so we get negative two. So if you take the input, two, one, this function will spit out the number negative two. Okay? Let's try f of zero, zero. I haven't called on, I haven't called on y'all in a long time, so let's do that. How about Reagan, is Reagan here? No, Reagan. How about uh, Alberto? Jared? I'm going through the people who haven't been here. Caden? Uh, I see Caden here. Yes. Uh, it'd okay. be a negative one third, right? I don't know. You think it is? Yeah? Anyone disagree? Anybody disagree? No? Okay, we're good. So good. All right. How about the next one? Okay, and you want to do the next one? Yeah, so it would be negative four. So square root of negative two. That's a two i, right? And then one minus three is over negative two. So this. So would it be i? But hold on, we've got, we're replacing the X with uh, negative four and then one here for yeah. Y. And then the X negative four minus three. So oh, yeah, so, negative four minus three, yeah. So you got negative, third negative two on top and negative seven on the bottom, right? Yes. And then you started to say something about I, right? Yeah. Okay, so I is off the table. All right, I is off the table. You go take that class called complex variables at some point in time, then you can start playing with I. But we can't play with I in here. So what we're gonna say is that this is, this basically is undefined, all right? This is what I hate about college algebra is that they, they start talking about I as if, if they're really gonna treat it the way it needs to be treated. It's all they're doing is just like opening the window and saying, hey, look in there, there's an I, and then they shut it and we never talk about it again. Okay, and it's because it's very problematic. So even though, yes, technically we can do this and get an I in here, in calculus, we're not allowed to mess with it. So this is undefined. Everyone all right with that? Okay, so look, I mean, we've dealt with this before. We've had functions back in college algebra where there were certain numbers you couldn't plug in, right? Well, here, there's a certain ordered pair that you can't plug in. You can't plug negative four, one into this function. You're not allowed to, all right? So now the next question is, all right, well, if there's some numbers that you can plug or some ordered pairs that you can plug in and there's some ordered pairs that you can't plug in, well, then why don't you tell me what, what the domain is? You know, what, can and, what can you plug in and what can you not plug in? 
All right. So let's talk about that. And let's see, Caden, I went through you. Let me see. How about Damien? Damien, you here? Uh, yeah. Okay, Damien. So I'd like for you, to, Damien, to look at this function and tell me about where you think we might have some issues, some problems with it. Is it uh, anything less than negative two on the x axis? How are you getting that? Because if it's uh, negative two or less, if you add the one either way, it'll be a negative on top. Okay, you that's it. what you're saying. If you have negative two here, but then you're assuming that the y is one then though, aren't you? That's true, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But Damien, you're saying that there could be a problem if this is ever negative, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so let's write that down, right? We will have a problem. We, we know that x plus y plus one. Okay, so I'm talking about domain here. So I'm, I'm thinking like, what do I need to happen? Damien is saying that we need to make sure that the radicand, right? The thing underneath the radical sign, the radicand, we need to make sure that that thing stays bigger than or equal to zero. It can't be negative, right? Now this is a linear inequality. So let's just solve this. And what I mean by that is let's isolate y. So I'm just gonna subtract x and subtract one. This is what I would need. This is the relationship that I would need. I would need that y is greater than or equal to negative x minus one in order for that to be true, right? Now, what else? There's another condition we have to look at here. There is another place that we have a problem. Margie, where else do we have a problem? You, you have a problem if the, uh, the x, uh, is ever a value like what it is in the bottom if it's a three if it's a positive three it's going to give you a zero and yeah, you're dividing by zero yeah so we need to make sure that x can't be can't be three right so we need this condition to be true all right we need that in order for this to be defined and we need to make sure that x is ne never three as long as those conditions are met then we should be able to plug the, that in all right so this is kind of like the domain of this. So how would I write this using what we call um, set, set notation? I would write this. Our domain is the set of all ordered pairs, okay? So it's every X and Y that you could ever come up with, such that, this bar means such that, such that, first of all, X, cannot be equal to three and y must be greater than or equal to negative x minus one. That's the way I'd write that. It's, it's all of the ordered pairs such that the x that you plug in here can never be three and this inequality must be true. So if you look back up here at this one right here, this didn't work because it doesn't satisfy this. If I just replace my x with negative four, right, and I replace my y with one, this won't be true. And we need both of these to be true in order for it to work. Are there any questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna wait on the range. I'm not gonna talk about range yet. Range is much more difficult to do. Okay, are there any questions on what we did here? Just plugging in ordered pairs, saying, hey, there's sometimes there's a problem and looking at the function to try and determine the domain. Now, I also ask you to sketch the domain in two-dimensional space, which means I would like for you to tell me what this looks like in 2D. In 2D what does that look like? So let's try and do that. So let's start with this first condition. X can't be three. Now, Daisy, are you there? I don't see Daisy. Abby? Yes. Okay, so um, my question to you is, well, let me say it this way. X can't be three, right? Right. What, what does X equals three look like in two-dimensional space? The vertical line. 
it's a vertical line, right? Right through x equals three. So if I'm looking at this domain, here's three. I know that my domain cannot include anything on that vertical line. So I'm gonna draw a dotted vertical line that which tells you, look, nothing on that line can be in our domain, right? Nothing there can, can be in our domain. Good. Now, Lorraine, are you here? Yes. Lorraine, you get the harder one. This right here, that's a linear inequality. Lorraine, do you recall at all from, I don't know, some class prior to this one, how you can graph the solution set to that linear inequality? If you don't, it's okay. Um, I do not remember. Okay, so let me ask you this, Lorraine. If this was an equal sign, like had that been an equal sign, not greater than or equal, do you know what that looks like? Yeah, it's it's still like um, um, like what is this visually like graphically? What is y equals negative x minus one? Is that you know it's not a sine function, not exponential, it's not a quadratic, right? It's linear. Yes, correct. It's linear and it'd be continuous. So it'd start from like, I guess one point of that inequality and then. Okay. So if I ask you to graph this line, you could start mm -hmm. by using the negative one as the y intercept. So I'm, I'm trying to get everyone to see this is y equals mx plus b. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what that is. So this is this number is our y intercept. So I could go to negative one. I could put that dot there, right? And then this number in front is our slope. So it goes down one over one, something like that. And then I would draw the line, wouldn't I? Lorraine, do you agree with that? Yes, I would agree. Okay, so everyone, that's what, that's what the answer would be if this was an equals, but it's not an equals, right? It's greater than or equal. So this line is part of my solutions but there's a bunch of other stuff too. So can anybody tell me how I get the rest of the answers? There's something you do now, once you have this line. Anybody? You shade you above shade it, it, right? You shade somewhere, right? You're either gonna shade above it or below it. Um, and it's not a guess, okay? And, I th and there's different ways this is taught. So um, I think there's dangerous way it's taught. And then there's the way that you, you can do that. You don't have to worry about getting yourself into trouble. All right. So the way I teach my students is once you have the line drawn, pick any point you want, either on the top or the bottom, above or below this line, pick a point and then test it, test it in here. Now, I always like to pick a point that's easy to test. So in this case, I actually have the origin, that red point. I can test that point into this. And if it turns out that it's true, whatever I write down is true, then I will shade above. But if it turns out to be false, I'll shade below. So let's just check it in here. If I plug in zero, zero, right? That's the point zero, zero. Let's plug it in here. Zero for Y, is that greater than, this is a question, is that greater than negative zero minus one? So is zero greater than or equal to negative one? That is true, right? And that means that every point on this side works. So our domain should be everything you see in red here, including this line, because the inequality had the, the equal underneath it. It should be everything on that line, everything in red, but you have to skip over this, right? You can't be, you can't be on this dotted line. And also down here, that's a hole right there. You have a hole right here because that three comes through, right? So you don't actually have that piece. So it's a pretty complicated, it's a pretty complicated little region in two-dimensional space, right? But this is saying that as long as we pick a point that lives in here, right? As long as we pick an X and a Y that lives in the red, then this function should be defined. If we try and pick something over here, it ain't gonna work. And that's where negative four, one was, right? Negative four, one, negative four, one was over here and it was outside the domain. So this is a nice way to visualize domains is by drawing them out. Questions? All right, so now let's just take a step back, forget that example we just did. 
So if we're taking points, if our input is, is coming from two dimensional space, right? And we're taking all those points and we're plugging them into this function that's spitting out a number, then if we look at this three dimensionally, we start to see a picture of, of what, it, what it creates. So here's an example, or here's the illustration. So what I want you to, to kind of see here is that the ground here, this is like our, our X, Y plane sitting on the ground, okay? So the ground is now the X, Y plane. I'm picking points, I'm picking some points, some ordered pair on the ground. So I come over some X, I go up some Y, that has X and Y, and then I plug it into the function and it's gonna spit out a number and whatever that number is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go up and draw a dot. So if it spits out four, I'm gonna go up four. If it spits out negative two, I'm gonna go down two, right? So whatever the function is, I start doing that for all the points in the domain. And as I do that, I start to get more and more points, right? For each of the points in the domain, I start to get all these points, all these points, and they all have different heights. And if I start putting them all together, I'm slowing my computer down a little bit here. If I start to put them all together, I start to create the surface, right? You'll see that. So I'm creating this surface in three-dimensional space. I got to back this out so my computer doesn't freak out. And if you put them all together, where's my surface? Hey, where, there it is. Okay. If you were able to put them all together, then you get a nice smooth surface there. You see that? So it's like, a, it's like a blanket that's blowing in the wind and then just like freeze and that's your surface, right? So that's what this is creating. These functions of two variables, two variables in, one number out, create surfaces, which is what we said it should, right? Because it was three variables in an equation and all we did was moved and got the Z by itself. So now we have this nice surface. What you're not gonna ever see is um, a, like a sphere. You won't see a sphere because, well, why wouldn't you see a sphere? Why can't a sphere be a function? Why couldn't it be a function? I don't know what it's called, but I'd say it fails the three-dimensional vertical line test. Exactly, exactly. It's almost like a vertical line test, but in three-dimensional space. Because if you have a sphere in here, right, then your ground is the x, y, if you take a point, it's gonna spit out a point that's gonna hit the sphere here, but then you have to have another point on the bottom where it hits the sphere. And so for one input, for that input, you have two outputs, one above and one below. And that's what makes it fail to be a function. You have one input, two outputs. And so, yeah, the way um, Daniel said that, I think that's pretty good. So like it fails a three-dimensional vertical line test. So we won't see things like that but we will see things that look like sheets blowing in the wind. All right, I'm gonna move on. This next picture is just to kind of, again, illustrate that the ground, the ground is actually our domain, right? The ground is our domain. And so as we take points in our domain, where is it? Oh, I need to show the point. There we go. So as we pick different points in our domain, Okay, depends on what, I guess, quadrant. See, I'm in the fourth quadrant. I pick some point, this is our domain. It's in two dimensional space. It spits out a number, and then that number lands somewhere up on our surface. Okay. And the point that comes out, right? The point that comes out here is the Z, right? That's the height of that point, And that's the function's value at X, Y. So we look at it from the top. Oops, All right. there we go. If we look at it from the top, right, you can see that from the top looking straight down, it's just our domain, right, on the ground, but there's actually a sheet there, right? All right, moving along. Go back to this. This is the problem we just did, right? That's the problem that, that we looked at and I asked us to write down what the domain was and we had come up with, uh, well, no, you know what, I won't do it here. We had come up with this domain, right? Remember that? That was our domain. Okay, y'all ready to see this function? I'm gonna have the computer graph this function for us, right? You ready to see it? 
It should be some, some sheet flowing in the wind. Here it is. This is what it looks like. I need to rotate this because my X and Y are in the wrong place. So here's what it looks like. Right. Let's look at it from the top. Well, let me rotate it around. There's something weird happening. Do y'all see this thing happening right here? Something strange is happening. That is a almost like a vertical asymptote. Right now, the computer is giving up. The computer is trying to draw this thing, the sheet just like going, going up to infinity, but at some point it has to give up, like the computer has to stop. So that's why the sheet kind of just cuts off. But, but technically this thing, this sheet just kind of keeps on going up infinitely. And on the other side, it kind of dives down. Do y'all see that? It just kind of like goes down. Now, what I think is cool is when you look at this from the top, because when you look at it from the top, it's our domain. Right? That's our domain. That's what we drew. It's everything above that line, but nothing on this line. So pretty cool. All right, so here's another one. I'm gonna let you, let's do breakouts. We haven't done breakouts um, in a while. Let's do a little breakout here. I'm only gonna give you about I don't know, five, 10 minutes maybe, 10 at the most, to see if uh, in groups you can come up with the, the three answers here. Or this is part A, B, and C. Um, and you know what, for now, let's not even worry about C. Just, just do the domain and range. Go ahead and write that down, write the function down, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open up the breakout rooms. There's going to be three to four of you in each room. So go ahead and join whenever you have that written down. Did you have it? Sorry, do you need that back? Terrence, by the way, oh, Maribel, you there? No.
Hey, Daniel, I got your your chat message. You're right. It, it is. It's just the prefix to that, you know, like whether or not it's like quintuple or whatever. Oh, oh, I'm like, what did I message this guy? Yeah, the general I'm like the general term for any uh, pair greater than a triplet would be a tuple. Yeah. And it's just whatever prefix you want to throw on there. But yeah. At some, at some point. Right. It doesn't make sense because you can get like, you know, a, a hundred, you know, 50 you know, numbers, right? So what do you call that, right? A, a tuple with 500 elements. Exactly, exactly. So, but what prefix are you going to throw onto that then? So Yeah, yeah, I don't think, I think at some point we don't, right? Just like with numbers, you know, you get to like a gazillion, right? <laughs> you yeah. know, you start, we just stop, stop having names for them. So definitely, definitely something, uh, annoying when you have to start visualizing larger dimensions of space. Yeah. OK, so um, I think everyone's back. Um, so that was just to give you an opportunity to kind of think through this. Uh, hopefully, everybody got part A is zero. Um, did, did anybody, does anybody want to volunteer like how they determine the domain of this? Um, I looked at the natural log and I know that nat in this case the the full natural log can only be greater than zero so anywhere that y squared minus x is greater than zero would give you the domain okay so we know we should all be familiar with the fact that the natural log is is only defined for positive numbers right you cannot plug in zero you can't plug in negatives so we would need that the y squared minus x stay positive right now, did you have any luck figuring out what that looks like in two-dimensional space? Yeah, it's technically not a function, but it's a parabola that goes along the uh, x-axis. OK. So if we look at this, I already did it here. So let me bring it. So we have this. We know that y squared minus x has to be greater than 0. So what we have here is what's called a quadratic inequality. It's an inequality that has a quadratic in it. So the way we solve quadratic inequalities is to first turn them into an equation. So I just turned this into an equal sign and I solved it. And I got y squared equals x squared, I'm sorry, y squared equals x, which I should know from pre-cal conic sections or college algebra when you study parabolas, that this is just a parabola that opens up sideways. Now, the, the thing is, because we had I used equals here and the original inequality does not have equals, that means I do not want to include that parabola as part of my answer. However, the parabola gives me a nice um, place to pick a test point. So I pick a test point. I, here I can't pick 0, 0 because it lies on the parabola. So I pick the test point 1, 0. That was just something I picked. It was kind of like, I guess you could say, inside the parabola. And I tested that into the inequality to see if it was true. And what I got was something that is not true. And that means that this point cannot be in the solution set, which means it has to be all the stuff on the other side of the parabola. So it's all this stuff on the outside forever, right? This goes forever in every direction. The parabola continues forever. So, you know, that's our domain. Anything in that region is, is our domain. Any questions on that? So you wouldn't have to solve all the way through for y well you could i stopped here i stopped here because if i solve for y at this point i take the square root and i would have to do plus or minus and yes you could use that but now you have two two graphs you have square root of x which is that i would of course i want it to be dotted because i don't want to include it and then negative square root of x which would be that purple one so you get the same picture. I stopped here because I stopped at a place where I said, okay, I know what that looks like. Okay, I think I just misunderstood because the way I did it was I had that y squared, uh, y um, has to be greater than the square root of x and then I limited x to be greater than zero. But I thought those were two restrictions I needed to put on x and y for the domain. Okay, so you're saying you took this and you, you just said y squared is greater than x like that? Yeah, and then I saw it, so then it was y is greater than the square root of x. 
And since X can't be uh, imaginary or I had to uh, limit what X was, so I created another, like, I guess, limit on the X value. Okay, so there's a couple of things there. First of all, it's, it's very dangerous to work with an inequality the way that you work with an equation. And that's because the way that things work when, when we have sign numbers, let me, let me try and give you an explanation. What if I tell you that X squared is greater than four? Okay. What if I tell you X squared is greater than four? Then if you take the square root on both sides, then you're gonna say X is greater than or equal to, or sorry, greater than plus or minus two. Do you agree that you would have to do plus or minus because you do square root? So this is saying two things. It's saying it's X is greater than two and X is greater than negative two. That's what that would be saying, right? Okay, but that's not gonna work, watch. Let's just draw this on a number line. Here's zero. Let's look at this first one. X is greater than two, which means it could be anything over here, right? Okay, let's just check over here. If you plug a number uh, bigger than two, like let's say three or something, then yeah, three squared is, is bigger than four, I agree. But the problem is this one right here. X being greater than negative two, well, here's negative two. Greater means anything to the right. And that means I could plug any number in here and it should work, but zero doesn't work, right? So the correct way to solve quadratic inequalities is to um, take this and turn it into an equation first. Then you solve, then you draw a number line, and then you pick test points. And you test and you see which of these regions work. So if you pick like three, three would work. So you'd say anything over here. If you plug zero in, zero won't work. So nothing works here. And then you plug in something like negative three and negative three squared is bigger than four. So that would work. So your domain here, or yeah, the solution set to this quadratic inequality would be everything to the left of negative two unioned with everything from two on to infinity. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Just be real careful when you're working with quadratic inequalities, there's a procedure, there's a process to, to solve them. And as soon as you try and start to do like algebra like this, you get, you get yourself in trouble because a negative times a negative is positive. And that's something that the inequality doesn't account for. Okay, let's take a look at this function. Y'all ready to see what this one looks like? This is a sheet in the wind. Here it is. There's, there's what it looks like. Now, please understand that these edges continue, right? These, there has to be a limit on how far I want to graph this on the computer, but these edges continue. And then do you see we have this diving down again, this, this weird kind of like it's dropping off, right? It's like a, almost like a black hole. Everything that gets close to that edge is just going to fall off into this abyss. And I think what's really cool again is if we go and we look at the surface and we look at it from the top, we're going to see our domain, right? We see our domain. I don't know. I just, I've always thought that's cool. All right. So how about this one? We'll go through this one a little bit quicker. Um, for this one, determine the um, determine the domain and sketch it in R2. So I'm going to take a look at the, uh, the radicand. Hey, by the way, just for language, language sake, we needed this thing in here and the previous problem, we needed that to be greater than zero, right? The thing that's sitting inside of a function like this, the thing that's sitting inside of the natural log, or if that was like sine or something like that, that is called the argument of the function. So here we needed the argument of the function to be greater than zero. Here, the thing underneath the root is called the radicand. So here we need the radicand to be what? For this to work, we, need, we would need that radicand to be positive, right? Or could it be zero? Yes. It could be zero, right? So we need nine minus x squared minus y squared to be greater than or equal to zero. 
All right, well, wait a minute, hold on. This is a quadratic inequality, right? Does anyone have any ideas on how we can figure out what the hell that is? X squared, Y squared. Hmm. Let's make it an equation first. So I'm gonna switch it to an equation first. Anybody recognize that equation in two dimensional space? Is that a circle? It is a circle. Let's move those the X and the Y to the other side. That is X squared plus Y squared is nine. That's a circle of radius three, right? Now, do we include the circle itself in our answer? We have equal here, don't we, in our, in our inequality, right? So we do want to include this. So our domain should be a circle of radius three, including the circle. Now, the question is, is it, is it the inside or the outside? So test something, right? Just test it. So let's just test zero, zero, because that's always a great point to test. If you plug zero, zero into this, you have to plug into inequality. Is it true? Nine minus zero minus zero, is that greater than or equal to zero? Yeah, that works, right? So that means everything in the circle should be part of our domain. So when I draw this function, I should be getting stuff just above this circle. That's the only place the surface exists, right? Now check this out. Before I show you what it looks like, does anyone have a guess of what it looks like? Remember this output, this output here is the Z, right? That's our Z value, our up and down. So if I replace this with Z and I give you this equation, square both sides. What would you get if you square both sides? Anybody recognize that equation? It's a sphere. That's a sphere of radius three, isn't it? Bring the x squared and y squared to the other side with the z squared. And you get a sphere of, ra of radius three. So that means when I draw this, it's not going to be the whole sphere. It's just going to be which part of it? Top part? Top half, right? Top half. Because think about it this way. If I started with this, that's the whole sphere, isn't it? That's the whole thing. If I go and I solve for z squared, I move the x squared and y squared to the other side, I get to here. And then from this step to this step, I'm supposed to do plus or minus, aren't I? And we are only looking at the positive one here. The positive part draws the top part of the sphere and the negative part draws the, the bottom part. Now we lost that. We lost that because when we did this direction and we squared it, we squared both sides. Remember this about algebra. You're always allowed to square both sides of an equation, but anytime you do it, you introduce the possibility of extraneous solutions. So that's what we did by squaring both sides here we introduced the other half of the sphere, but it helped us see what it's gonna look like, I guess. So it was kind of worth it. So here it is, boom, there, that's it, okay? All right, now there's nothing that says that we have to stop at a function of two variables. N nothing that says that we have to, you know, take ordered pairs and spit out a number. We could take an ordered triple and spit out a number, right? Take in X, Y, and Z, and then spit out some value. But the problem with this is that if we're doing a function like this, we're gonna be going with three inputs into one input or one output, and that's gonna require a four dimensional space. And that's, that's not happening, right? It's not happening. But we can still talk about the domain we can still discuss what the domain looks like, right? So like in the previous problems, we had functions that when you visualize them, they're in three-dimensional space, the domain was the ground, which was two-dimensional, and we could visualize that. Here, we have a function that goes from three-dimensional space into one. We can't visualize the function, but we can still look at the domain. Now let's do one. So here we go.
All right, so we have this function f of x, y, z. It's got three inputs, x, y, and z. Uh, we could figure out what one, two, zero is. I'm not even gonna do that because you just plug in one for x, two for y, and zero for z, and you get a number, right? Big deal. Um, but what about the domain? Well, same thing that we talked about before. Well, let me ask somebody. Is Fabiola here? Yes, I'm here. How's it going? It's going good, how are you? I'm doing all right. Okay, so in terms of this problem, Fabiola, in domain, what is it that has to be has to happen in order for this function to be defined? What what must what? Um, uh, it must be greater than zero. Uh, okay. The uh, what, the argument. Okay. So we'll do. You mean all of this, right? Yes. Has to be greater than or equal. You said equal, right? Oh no, I didn't. But I did mean equal to okay. zero as well. Okay. So good. We have that. Now, when you look at that, Fabiola. Do you recognize that at all from things we've done? Turn it into an equation. Um, just a sphere? I mean, yeah. oh, well, not a sphere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh well, yeah, it's the nine. Yeah, it would just be a, OK, yeah, I understand, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that that right there, if we just look at the equal condition here, then it's gonna be this sphere of radius three, right, Fabiola? Yes. Okay, now this radius is three. Now my question now, Fabiola, is is it is it just the shell of the sphere or is it like everything inside the sphere which would make it a ball or is it everything outside the ball? So just like we did before, can't we just pick a test point? Yeah. Okay, so what's a really good yeah. test point? And remember, uh, we're in three-dimensional three space here, right? Yeah, I was going to say the um, origin. I guess. OK, so that would be like 0, 0, 0? Yes. OK, test that in here. Plug in 0, 0, 0 for x, y, and z, respectively, and tell me if that's true. Yes. It is, right? So that means everything yes. inside that sphere is also part of the domain. And yes. that means we have a ball, right? So it's the domain of this. The domain is a ball in R3 with radius 3. So it's this picture, but I'm just telling you it's everything inside also and everything on the surface. So this is this is the weird part, like what in Fabiola, good, we're done. Um, what we're saying is that if you want to be able to plug things into this function, the things you plug in are ordered triples that have to be within this ball. So if you give me an ordered triple that lives in this ball, then this function f will send that to a number and it will be defined. Now, it'll whatever number it sends it to, it sends it to. I can't visualize the function because I need that other fourth dimension for the output. Um, but if you try and pick something outside the ball, well, that function won't be able to handle it. So where would this become useful? Well, how about this? What if, what if, you, were, what if you were talking about, I don't know, where, where do we see things that look kind of like balls? Like the Earth, right? Okay, so maybe maybe the we're talking about the Earth, right? And the function's value, right? The function's value is maybe the temperature at each point, right? So like for each point on the ball or within the ball, there is a temperature, and maybe this function is the function that spits out that temperature. So what you're doing is you're just the point represents where you are on the planet. And then the output is what the temperature is at that point. So that would be something that you could see being, you know, applicable, you know, in many different ways. You could even talk about maybe at each point, the function somehow gives you the, uh, the force of gravity at each point. 
right? Because gravitational force is not constant, right? It's always different at different, um, depending on where you are, the further away you are, the, the less force, right? So, I mean, we treat gravitation as a constant, but it's never constant, right? It's always different depending on your, your position on earth. So there are lots of reasons why we would wanna have a function that has three inputs and one output. All right, that brings us to the end of this section. This is just an introduction to functions of several variables. And we're ready now to jump into the next section. Any questions? I ask you to do these problems. I say on these, try the range. Don't, don't beat yourself up over the range. If you can't get it, don't worry about it. The, really, the only one that we could have really done range easily on is this one. And that's because, um, when you look at that, because it's nine minus something squared minus something squared, we know that the squared numbers here can never be negative. So, so when you subtract them, it's always gonna be taking something away. So the biggest this could ever be would be nine. And then square root of nine is three. So the, the largest output of this function would be three. And then the smallest output would be zero because we know that the square root can never give you a negative number. So that one might, you might be able to kind of mess with that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna test you on range. Ranges of functions of, of several variables is not something easy to do. Do y'all remember how, how you can um, determine the range if you're back in college algebra, an easy way to determine range? No? I'll, I'll just show you real quick. So back in college algebra, you're given a function that has a domain, right? This domain of f, f goes and spits it out over here. And here's the range of f. Well, it turns out that in college algebra, you learn about this thing called the inverse function. And what the inverse function does is takes everything over here back to where it came from. So if we can just find a way, if we're given f, if we can find a way to come up with that inverse, then whatever the domain of this is, the domain of the inverse function, so we're going from this direction this way, whatever the domain of this function is, is equivalent to the range of that function. So finding the range of f is equivalent to finding the domain of its inverse. So all you have to do in college algebra is, you know, give me a function. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, square root of x squared plus x, something like that. And then I go find its inverse. Do you remember how to find inverses? You replace f of x with y. You switch the x and the y. Does that not work past the second dimension or? And then, yeah, and then you um, solve for y, right? So something like um, so you, yeah, the question is, does it not, does it work? It, it would work if it was easy to find the inverse. See, but the problem is, see, with two variables, it's easy because all you're doing is you're, you're trying to take all your X's that turned out to be Y's, you're trying to take your Y's back to X's. So that's why when you do this technique, you switch all your X's and Y's because you need them to interchange their positions. But when you have more than two variables in there, what are you switching? Does that make sense? Like if Z equals, let's say X squared plus Y squared here like that, then am I, am I changing, am I making this X and that Z or am I making this Y and that Z? You, does that make sense? It's not a simple process to get an inverse when you go, when you're, when you're looking at um, a function of several variables. If, if it exists, then yes. If you could find it easily, then yes, it would still work, but it's, it's the actual finding of it that's hard. All right. All right, so now, college algebra pre-cal, you learn about all these functions, right? And then you go to calculus one, and you're like, hey, remember all those functions? We're gonna do this thing called the limit, right? And then we're gonna talk about continuity. So that's what we're about to do now. Now that we have this new idea of a function of several variables, can we still talk about limits of those functions and continuity? And the reason why we're doing this is because what came after the limit and continuity in Cal 1? 
Crafty studied limits and continuity. What came immediately after that? Derivatives. Derivatives, right? So what we're trying to build to is, is it possible for us to talk about the derivative of a, on a surface? Well, in order to have a derivative, you have to have limits. So here we go. All right, so in Cal 1, we learned the precise definition, well, not precise definition, we learned a definition of the limit. And we said that when we write down limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l, it just meant that as x gets closer to a from the left and the right, the function approached some value l. So let's take a look at what the limit means back in Cal 1. So here's a function. This is actually a very famous function. Um, it's sine of x over x. That's what's graphed here in blue. And you learned in, in calculus one that the limit as x approaches zero of this function is one. That was something that you were told very early on. And you had to just take it on faith that this limit was one. Because when you try and plug zero in here, sine of zero is zero. And then over zero, you get division, you get zero over zero. So um, you're told that it's one. And then can someone tell me how you can verify that later, that it is one? After you learn L'Hopital, right? Once yeah, you learn L'Hopital, then you can take derivative of the top and bottom and it's an easy problem. But that's not what's important here. What's important is for you to remember that in Cal 1, when we were talking about the limit as x approached zero, right? What it meant is we had to look at the function and we had to approach zero from both sides and whatever the y value was getting close to is our limit, but it had to be the same from both sides, right? So if for some reason that those two red dots were not converging to the same point, then the limit wouldn't exist, right? Had to be the same from both sides. And also it didn't matter what was happening at zero. Like at zero, it's undefined. That's not important. The limit says what's happening is you get close, get closer and closer and closer. This is getting closer, closer to 0.96. All right, so what? Here's another one. This limit, um, as x approaches zero on this one, here this limit would not exist, right? Because the dots are going two different places. So no limit, right? No, this limit does not exist because we have a jump. This limit does exist. All right, so the important thing is that in 2D, uh, in the two dimensional graph, the limit had to exist from both sides, had to be going to the same place. That's the important thing. For a limit of a, a, yeah, for the limit of a function of several variables, we are trying to determine what the function is approaching as we get closer and closer to a point a, B. So let's go back to this. See what we're doing here is we're saying, all right, we're looking at the point zero, right? That zero is in the domain of the function. Well, it's actually not, but because you can't plug zero in, but it's it's part of our input, right? We're trying to see what's happening as we let our x values get closer and closer to that. What's happening? What's the output? And so we come in from both sides of zero, right? Come in from both sides. Here, what we're doing is we're taking a limit and we're letting not x approach some value, we're letting the ordered pair x, y, so we're letting a point in two-dimensional space approach some point in two-dimensional space in, within our domain, and we're trying to figure out whether or not the function is approaching a value. So I'm gonna write that a little different. Limit, we're trying to say, what happens if I let this point get closer and closer to that point and what does the function get closer to? Does it approach some value? Does anybody see why this is going to be a complete freaking disaster? There's a near infinite amount of variables you could deal with there. What do you mean? I mean, depending on what the function is, you could, x could be pretty much any value and y could be any value that approach from any side. Okay, yeah, so let's think about this from the, from the perspective of just the domain. If we look at the function, right, here's the domain of this function, whatever it is, domain of the function f of x, y. 
So let's just assume that the domain of this function is, is everything down here, the, all of the ground. We're saying to ourselves, what happens is I approach this point AB. Okay, so I wanna know what happens as I start to approach that point AB, what's happening to the value of the function, which is not in this picture, right? It's in the three-dimensional picture. So you're saying, Benjamin, that what? What about this is a mess? You can approach it from any side. Yeah, how do you approach that point? How do you approach it? Like back here, if I ask you to approach zero, right? Here's zero. You can only approach from these two sides. That's it, right? That's it. Left side, right side, that's it. Two options. But when we're looking at this, when we're looking at this, right? Over here, how, how do we approach AB? So yeah, you could approach it like this. You could just say, all right, I'm just gonna come in like, just like that, go straight into it there. Or you could come in like this, or you could come in like this, or you could come in like this, right? But what's stopping you from coming in at different angles? How many different ways can I actually approach that? Pretty much infinitely. Infinitely many ways, right? All of those paths are leading to the point. Now, it was nice in Cal 1 because we only had to check two sides, and that's it. We're done. But how do we check an infinite number of paths? Not only that, but why does it have to be a straight line? Can't I just come in like this, all crazy, right? Just like wiggle my way in? Or couldn't I even be like even more of a rebel and be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spiral into it. Like I'm going to do a death spiral into the point and approach it like that, right? There's an infinite number of paths leading into that point. And it's impossible for us to, to check all of them. And that is a major problem. So this, this diagram here, I'm going to clear this out. This was just me trying to show how, how many different ways I could approach this point. We don't need that. So this means there's an infinite number of paths that we can approach the point AB. For the limit to exist, and this is the killer. This is the killer. Oops. For the limit to exist at a point, the limit must exist and be the same for every path leading to A and B. The definition of the limit requires that it must exist from every, every single path, which is impossible. It's just impossible for us to do. So what's, what, what's the takeaway of this? Finding the limit of functions of several variables is generally very hard, if not impossible, all right? So, but don't, don't worry, we got a way around it, don't worry, all right? I just want you to recognize the, the problem. So let's talk about this one. I just told you we can't do this because we can't check every path, right? For us to say that the limit exists, right? That the function is headed somewhere. If I, if I, can, if I wanna say that, I have to check every path. And then now I'm asking you to, to do it. So <laughs> why would I torture you? All right, let's see why. So here's, here's the, the function. This, this is our function right there. Uh, let me take this over to another place here. All right, so evaluate this limit. So the function we're looking at here is the function of two variables. It's the function x squared minus y squared over x squared plus y squared. And we are approaching the point zero, zero. So let me think about what that looks like. Look, let's talk about the domain. I want to approach that point zero, zero. I have an infinite number of paths to choose from. So let's start with one that I think we'd be comfortable with. And that is, let's approach it along the x-axis 
and let's approach it from both sides, okay? So we're gonna approach from the left and from the right on the x-axis. So you tell me, if I'm on the x-axis, what is fixed? If I'm you're on the x-axis, it's the path that's fixed? Well, imagine that I'm moving in with points, getting closer and closer to that black point along the x-axis. What is, so what is the, definitely constant as we come in? The y value. The y value. The y value is what? Zero. 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 And it's not close to zero. It is zero, right? It is zero. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, look, along the x-axis is where I'm going to come in first. And as I come in along the x-axis, my limit changes because instead of it going from x, y to zero, it's going from x, zero Sorry, instead of going from x, y to zero, zero, it's going from x, zero to zero, zero. Okay, so the big key here is that I've changed that y there. I've changed it to zero because I'm on the x-axis. So it's not close, it is zero. Now what's nice about that is that now I can go into this limit and I can replace all my y's with zero because they are identically zero. And when I do that, what happens? If I replace the y's here with zeros, I just get what? You get y. X squared over x squared, which when we reduce this fraction gives me one. So what that's saying is that as I start to approach the point zero, zero, right? In three-dimensional space, if this is my x-axis, this is my y, and here's my z, here's what I can tell you, is that when I approach this black point here on the x-axis, what I can tell you is that the y value of the function, the output of the function, is getting closer and closer to one. This is one unit high, okay? It's approaching one. Now, I'm not telling you it is one, okay? It's not one because you actually can't plug zero, zero into this. It's undefined, but that's okay. It's just like that sine, sine X over X. It's we're coming in and we're approaching one. And so we're good, but I've got to check every path. I've just checked it for one path. So what do you think I'm really doing here? Cause I can't check every path. What do you think I'm, I'm hoping for? To find a, a condition where it's not true. Yeah, so Our, what, if I, what if I come in from a different path and I get a different answer than one? Then what can we say? There's no limit. Then the limit will not exist. So what we're doing here is, I'm not giving you this problem to, to, to have you tell me what the limit is. We're hoping that the limit doesn't exist. And that's really the only thing we can check for is that it doesn't exist. And we're just hoping that two different paths are gonna give us two different answers. So let's now try along the y-axis. I'm gonna come in now along the y-axis headed towards that. And so if I come in along the y-axis, what can you tell me is fixed? X is zero. X is zero this time. So I'm gonna rewrite the limit. This time I'm gonna replace the X with zero. The Y is not fixed. And I'm gonna be approaching zero, zero. And this is for the same function. And now I go in and I replace all my X's with zeros. And when I replace my X's with zeros, I get negative Y squared over Y squared and those cancel out and I just get negative one this time. And this is when I start jumping for joy because these two are not equal. Right, they're not equal, which means this limit does not exist because for it to exist, coming into zero from every path must lead to the same value. And I just showed that from two different paths, 
I have two different values. Now this is hard to see, but when we were doing this along the x-axis, our, our function was approaching one, but if we come in along the y-axis, it's approaching negative one, which is down here. Boy, it's really hard. Let's take a look at the function. I'd like for us to see the surface because this is weird. This is kind of a weird idea what's happening here. Do y'all like to see it? Here it is. This is the surface. Looks almost like this weird. You know what it looks like to me? Do you ever play that little thing in grade school where you folded up the paper and you do that little thing like? Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. That's kind of kind of what it looks like to me. Eh, I don't know. Maybe not. Okay. So let me try and orient this properly, so you can see what's happening here. So we've got this weird surface. Here's the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis is coming up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the surface out a little bit so, you, so it's not in our way. And when we were coming in along the x-axis, do you see that green dot? The green dot is moving along the x-axis. The black dot is the output of the function. So can you see that the, the black dot is up at 1 the whole time as I move along the x-axis? It's up at 1. All along the x-axis, up at 1. Now, if I, if I change this now and I come in and I do the y-axis instead, now the green dot, we're moving along the y-axis and notice that the black, which is the value of the function, see it's down at the bottom, it's at negative one. And so, oh, I'm undefined at zero. Yeah, right there at zero, it's undefined, but if I go past it, it's negative one. So along one ridge, along one ridge, you're up at one, but you come in the other way, you're, you're down at negative one, therefore the limit doesn't exist. All right, what do y'all think? So limit doesn't exist. We got different results along different paths. Okay, what about this one? Why don't we try the same thing, right? I mean, that, that kind of worked last time. So maybe the same thing will work this time. I already kind of see that it won't. It won't? Okay, let me see. What are you seeing? Why are you saying it won't? Well, if you replace either X or Y, you will always get zero. Yeah, so if you come in along the X axis, Y is gonna be zero, right? And that will kill off the numerator and you'll just get zero. But if you come in along the y axis, x is zero. So then that'll also kill off the numerator, and both of them will be equal to zero, which tells you nothing. But let's still go through it. I'm going to go quickly through it, though. I'm going to come in along the x axis. That means that y is zero. And so I'm going to go limit x zero approaches zero, zero of x, y over x squared plus y squared, I get to replace all of my um, y's with zero. And when I do that, I get zero over x squared, which is zero. If I do the y-axis, that means x is zero. And I'm going to do this one a little faster. That means limit zero, the x gets replaced with zero, zero y approaches zero, zero. And when I replace the x with zero, I get zero over y squared, which is still zero. So these two are the same. So that means I picked two paths, they both head to zero. It's looking like the limit might be zero, but I've only checked two out of an infinite number of paths. So why don't we check a different path? Well, we've already done the x-axis. We've already done the y-axis. What, what else could we do? You only have an infinite number to choose from. <laughs> so it's kind of up to you. We've done this. And we've done this. Anyone have a different path? Y equals x. Y equals x. OK, how about the diagonal line? That's y equals x, right? So y equals x would bring us in like this. 
So th what that means is I'm going to come in along, I'm gonna come in along y equals x. Okay, that's a line, right? I'm gonna come in along this line. So that means I'm going to rewrite the limit and everywhere I see a y, I'm gonna replace it with x. I could also have replaced the x with y, but I'm gonna replace the y with x. And so that becomes x times x over x squared plus x squared. Y'all see what I've done? I took this, I replaced this y with x, I replaced that y with x and that y with x. And when I do that, let's see what that is algebraically. Limit x, x approaches 0, 0. I get x squared over 2x squared. And hey, check that out. Algebra, right? Gone, gone. My answer is 1 half. And that is not the same as 0. It's different, right? So because it's different, the limit doesn't exist. Any questions? Yeah, um, so if all we do is just repeat the process, what happens if there is a limit that does exist? Well, you'd never be able to show me this way. Right now, there will be a way. I'm not going to have time today to cover it, but we will use the squeeze there, squeeze theorem to be able to do it. But it only works for certain ones. I wanted you to see this function. All right, I wanted you to see the surface. Here's, uh, yeah, here's the surface right here. This is it. So as you come in along the x-axis, the y value is zero. I mean, sorry, the z value is zero, the output is zero. If you come in along the, the um, y axis, the z value is still staying at zero. It isn't until you come in along y equals x. This is y equals x. So um, hopefully you can see it from the, from the top. See, I'm coming in, here's x, here's y. I'm coming in along the top. And you can see that when we do that along the top, our y value is up here at a half. So it's different. So the limit doesn't exist. So in general, it's very difficult to show the limit exists because we, can, we can't check every path. So we are only going to focus on trying to show that limits don't exist. That'll be our main emphasis here. All right, this one here. I only have four minutes. So let's just, let's just try and run through it quickly. If we come along the x-axis, y is zero, right? And that will give me zero, because I'd replace that with zero. If we come in along the y-axis, x is zero, and that will give me zero here again. Now, what about if y is equal to x? Let's just go for that one right now. What if y is x? I'll replace all my y's with x. What would I get there? x cubed on top and on the bottom, x squared plus x to the fourth. Y'all agree? What does that give you? Can you do any algebra here? You could, you could factor out the bottom in x squared, right? And then cancel here, cancel here. You should just get x over one plus x squared. What happened, yes or no? Yes? Okay, yeah, what, what happens if you let x go to zero here? It goes to zero. It goes to zero which means that along the x-axis, y-axis, and y equals x, it all gave you zero, which means that you still need to check another path. 
Any ideas on a path? I'd say Ooh. y equals negative x, but that because it's squared would still just give you zero. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna have to end class. So I'm, I'm gonna just have to reveal to you the path that works here. And it's not gonna be something you would have thought of, I don't think off the top of your head. The path we're gonna use, so this is me saying, hey, look, along, along the x-axis, we get zero. Along the y-axis, we get zero. Along, well, I didn't do mx, but along y equals x, it, we get zero. Uh, ooh, wait, hold on. What? I think that's a, that's a typo. Sorry, that was a typo on the last one. So look at, here's what will work. X equals Y squared. You have to come in along a parabola that comes in sideways. Look at this surface. It's a really weird looking surface. But that's, the, that's what it'll take along this curve. So we would have to go in and we would have to do this limit. You can see this limit right here. We'd have to replace all of our x's with y squareds. So replace that with y squared. Replace that with y squared. Replace that with y squared. Let's see what we would get. It'd be y squared times y squared on top, y to the fourth. And then we would have y squared squared, which would be y to the fourth plus y to the fourth. That would give you two y to the fourth on the bottom. And that's the algebra that works because then these cancel out and you just get a half. Not a very natural thing to do, but I wanted to show that to you at least before you go try and do any homework for this. Um, I have not done any of the squeeze theorem one. So this is where we are for the homework. I just want to tell you which problems that you can do at this point. So on those problems, five through 13 odds, I will tell you that numbers five, seven, and 11 are the ones that you can do. Uh, sorry, five, seven, 11, and 15. So five. That'd be higher than 13. Oh, sorry, I thought it said 15 there. Five, seven, and 11. Okay, those you can do, which means that nine, and 13, let me just double check this. Nine and 13 are going to require um, the squeeze theorem, which we haven't talked about. So I would just skip nine and 13 for now. All right, so you now have homework uh, set for two sections, right? 11.1 and 11.2. We covered two topics today. Almost finished this one. We're not completely done. But that's a good thing because we are at least we can say we're up kind of through here. So I made up a little bit of time today. All right, everyone. That's it for the week, right? Jeez. How are those mini exams going? Y'all ready for another one? No. They're going. Okay. Hey, please reach out for help, okay? I do not, I've already said this to you all, but you know, there's things that I'm hoping that, I'm hoping you'll ask questions because I don't want you to turn it in and do something that you thought you were doing right and it winds up you were way off. Cause you know, I'm here to help you to push you in the right direction. And um, if you're not getting the help and you turn it in, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's, it's wrong. You know, it's like you've had the opportunity to ask questions, you didn't ask questions and you know, is what it is. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, y'all have a good weekend. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. I'll hang out for a minute if you have a question. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day.